<clears throat> the sun is still kind of shining through my blind, so I can't move over too, too far. <laughs> yeah. Where where do you live now? I'm in Maryland. I mean, I know, but I mean, where are you like in Greenbelt or, or where? Oh, gotcha. I just northwest of Greenbelt. Okay. When I was yeah. working there, I had my my apartment in uh, Laurel, so like two stops up the BW Parkway. Nice, nice. Hey, you know what? If you ever want to, you know, be a speaker for us, you know, in your old stopping yeah, postdoc grounds, a- I can I can hook you up. Thank you. Yeah, I'd appreciate that sometime. I'm going to try doing a, a, a demonstration as well. I'll, at some point, I'll, I'll stop sharing my screen and I'll switch on the camera again. I've got a physical gravitational lens here. Ooh. So hold it up in front of pictures. Then I'm going to have to practice with the camera. And I might have <laughs> to pull some more light. But when you get it just right, oh boy, that's hard to do it backwards. Let's see here. I've got to test this out. That might work the best. And then I'll put on the light. Okay, there. There you go. Now I've got an Einstein ring around one of those. I've got to do this backwards. Okay, I'll see about that. Let me see what what it looks like with the overhead light. Okay, I was practicing it out without the camera and that biases. Oh wait, that might work better, okay. That that looks like it would work, oh yeah. Holding it from the side and not the front. There we go. This is just the base of a wine glass that had broken off. And so, um, but it, it works as a great model of a gravitational lens. And I picked that up from one of the guys who did one of the big uh, early lens surveys in the 90s. Oh, that's cool. And you know what? You're recycling, so. Exactly. <laughs> also, you'll notice I've got like two of these from a couple of glasses, but this one I've actually, um, see there? I was practicing making, um, trying to make lenses like, um, Anton, uh, let me see, I think it was Anton von Leeuwenhoek who had made his single lens microscopes that were back in the 1600s, but they were better than the best of the compound microscopes at the time. And nobody could figure out how he got his lenses so good. And what he did was they were very tiny lenses, but he made, uh, he kind of pulled out a little, a little uh, drove out glass with a, with a flame and then let it beat up a bit and he got a simple drop shaped lens, a spherical lens. And there's a technique, and I think it was in uh, um, the amateur scientist column in Scientific American decades ago. But anyway, I was practicing making one of those there. I've got this um, 19th century field microscope here. No lens in it, but the lens would simply fit right in there. And it took me forever to figure out how you would get a lens that would fit in that. I finally realized it would be a sphere. Oh, and the interesting. Slide, so you don't have to worry about centering it. It just, it, the bevel yeah. center it. And the slide is right there. That's the oh. microscope slide. And you just hold oh. that up, hold that up to the sun. Yeah, hmm. that's cool. Do you use a microscope very much, Tim? Nah, actually this one, like I said, doesn't have the lens, but uh, I liked it as an, as an antique instrument. Yeah, science instruments are cool. Yeah, but so at some point I'll, I'll get a, a lens built for that thing. I think I'll turn that light back off. When I was in London, I, I think it was the Natural History Museum or whatever, the really big one that they have there. British Museum? They have that whole room, a giant room of science instruments, you know, from way back. This Mm -hmm. is so cool. Uh, I've got, I picked up whenever the um, physics department was throwing out old demonstration equipment, I would go pick it up. This is back in college. And I picked, so I, I picked up, you know, little stuff like this. I bought this one, but there were others I picked up and saved. 
World War II optics. I've got an old uh, artillery site down there. And I got this. Ooh. You know what that is? I don't know. It's cool, though. It is, a, <laughs> it is an Edison phonograph from 1881. What? 200 wow. And Ooh. there are 20 known to exist today. Three of them are in the Smithsonian. And I, they were throwing it out. They were throwing it out. Oh. Oh, it was. Caitlin and Tim, uh, this this section right here is a visualization from the ESA about uh, gravitational lensing. I thought it would be appropriate just to show this. I love to show the visualizations from from ESA and NASA. That is Goddard. A great Goddard does a lot of visualizations too, which is really cool. Still looks like a smiley face. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> There's one that I've seen labeled as the smiley face gravitational lens. Oh boy. <laughs> Not how we come up with the kind of common names for these things. Oh, for sure. Okay. So uh, I made the little mistake of like broadcasting before I was ready to broadcast this show. So we were like, Live broadcast. We're already in this. <laughs> so hello. Cool. Now you know our whole lives. You know all that we're going to talk about. You guys have a great weekend. Bye. <laughs> um, no, it's great. Um, this is uh, this is Caitlin's uh, second um, install of seven months of science, and uh, so uh, I thought it was a great title. Um, you know, Caitlin is uh, someone that's full of passion and just absolutely uh, thrilled. I, I can imagine she, she wakes up in the morning just running to work because it's like, you know, I get to do this today, you know? So, uh, and I love that about uh, pretty much everyone in the science community because they are, uh, you know, they love what they do. Um, I know that there's kind of the rough and tough part about being a professional in the science world because you compete, right? So um, amateur astronomers, we're kind of all kumbaya and holding hands and, and sharing everything we know. Uh, um, uh, professional scientists are like, it can be like that as well, but I've, I've also seen the com competitive side and, and uh, you know, so it's, it's uh, it can be tough uh, being in the in the world of professional uh, research and stuff. So it's it's uh, um, I, I'm often reminded of that um, as I talk to people such as yourselves. So, but you guys seem nice. So, well, thank you. <laughs> and all the other guys I've talked to are nice too. So I don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, um. Well, Tim and I have known each other for quite a few years now. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so this is very exciting. What? You were still in college when we met. Yes. <laughs> wow. Absolutely. Okay. We've met uh, at Green Bank. Mm. Green uh, Bank Observatory. At, at Blackwater oh, Falls. Oh, no. At Blackwater Falls. That's right. And then later on in Green Bank. Yep. <coughs> yeah. Blackwater Falls astronomical uh, event. Yep. <laughs> and, uh, Kim Hamilton, I've read that you are a director of a planetarium and yes. you're a professor of physics. Um, maybe you can tell us more about your your uh, background. Oh, sure. So uh, <coughs> uh, background, I'm an East Tennessee hillbilly from the Smoky Mountains and uh, <laughs> uh, I grew up on a farm, a very small farm on uh, Chilhowee Mountain. And the uh, who, uh, by the way, I, I found out recently uh, my little communities, there, there's no town there, but our little communities claim to fame is that uh, we were mapped out and, des and described in 1567 uh, by uh, one, a very poorly known Spanish conquistador who had gone on trying to smooth over relations with the local Indians after DeSoto had gone and burned a whole lot of bridges there. Mm. And uh, he comes right up my cove, up my the little valley in front of our mountain, uh, within inside of my parents' farm in 1567. Wow. At the gates of the end of the mountain, and then he turned around and hightailed it back because he got a word that uh, they were about to get ambushed. But oh, uh, so anyway, we're kind of, we're, we're literally on the map from 440 years ago. 
and oh. uh, it was kind of, kind of sp sleepy little place there now. Okay. But it's got, it does have great views of the skies. Uh, my parents would take us out in the cow pasture uh, at night sometimes. We'd spread out the space blanket and just do some stargazing. And mm -hmm. that's where I'd really gotten my first taste of that. I remember my parents waking uh, my sister and me up sometimes after we'd gone to bed at night uh, when there would be a meteor shower and, uh, mm. and take us out there. So um, uh, that's been a nice, a really nice thought there. Uh, we're up, uh, my family's farm borders the, the Smoky Mountains National Park. I mean, literally the, the front end up the mountain of us, there is the boundary trail between our-, our Oh, that's and cool. Us. That's great. <laughs> you don't have a lot of neighbors then. Not that, many neighbors, uh, certainly <laughs> like it that way. <laughs> and um, so anyway, I went on to uh, Rhodes College in Memphis and uh, got my uh, degree in physics. Uh, mm -hmm. But all of my physics professors, except for one, were astronomers. And mm -hmm. um, I mean, all of them. And we had, what, six or seven professors there. Uh, the students, <laughs> the class ratio was great. There were four majors my year to the year ahead of me and so on like that. You got a lot of attention. Uh, so I got to do a little bit of astronomy research work uh, uh, one summer there, and um, that got me a taste for it even more and went on to the University of Pittsburgh, uh, largely because I liked the Allegheny Observatory, which I'd seen in their, in their flyer posters up there. Oh, yeah. uh, but I, I was looking and saw that the, um, the uh, uh, GRE scores, uh, graduate exam scores, to get into Pitt were well above the average was was noticeable not way above but noticeably above my score and I thought well it's a long shot but I'll try and I'd also put in at um, uh, Arizona State for example another good astronomy school where I was right at the average I thought all right that's that's at least easy took Arizona like a week or two weeks to reject me and I got my best offer from Pitt so you never know <laughs> um, mm -hmm. but anyway the uh, so I went to Pitt and worked on the uh, um, uh, did my research at the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore, mm. which runs mm. the Hubble, and um, uh, then uh, graduated with my PhD in astrophysics, working on quasars uh, back in 2001, and uh, wow. got to use the Hubble Space Telescope for, uh, uh, went through the archives for all of those data, and then I went to Goddard Space Flight Center, where Caitlin is now, uh, when I was a postdoc with the National Research Council. Uh, it was just a two-year two-year thing then, and I was uh, dead set on getting a permanent job as quickly as I could, and um, I wound up at this uh, little state uh, university at Shawnee State, which is in Ohio. Uh, so my wife and I live in Huntington. She's a professor at Marshall University here in town, and mm -hmm. then uh, we've been active with the uh, uh, doing outreach, uh, like at uh, the... the uh, 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 astronomy weekend at Blackwater Falls at uh, uh, Green Banks uh, StarQuest, mm -hmm. and with the planetarium, I do a lot of outreach with that. Um, I've recently built a uh, an Apollo spaceflight simulator for our physics students. Huh? And, yeah, Caitlin's got to, gotten to see. It. Did you try it? Out? <laughs> was it cool, Caitlin? Oh, it was awesome. Yes, yes, I got to do oh, the that's simulation. Right, yeah, because I did it at yeah. Green Bank too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We were your guinea pigs for a couple of days. Yes. <laughs> Uh, it it's, it's an entire great. mission simulator. So I've got an entire uh, uh, mission control. All the flight controllers have their computers laid out there. It's all networked together. My laptop, which I'm broadcasting this from here, runs the simulation. And so they say, oh, see all this data and telemetry coming down like the actual mission control would. And then there are three astronauts, which we put off in a different room and we've got radios to talk to them and such. And yeah. they've got a control panel and a little window view in their computer and they fly the thing or sometimes don't. And uh, we had some crashes and people pulling 26 G's on re-entry and they were, they were having a real laugh when they found out that they had died after. <laughs> oh. Uh, but we, we, we get a lot of them <laughs> doing it successfully as well. <laughs> We can't give them any help on re It's hard to laugh after you've you died, you know? But you can't really help yourself, right? You just oh, want to. Yeah. yeah. You find out that. <laughs> I had one student. You have my week. sense of humor, Tim. So <laughs> this is going to be easy. <laughs> well, I, I videotaped my class doing it this year. And um, 
they were cracking up over there in the other room with the astronauts. They, were, they weren't sure the first two, three flights what they were doing on re-entry. And they were doing things like coming in upside down or backwards or whatever. And, and were, I mean, not actually, they're supposed to come in upside down and backwards, but they were the other way around. And then they, I saw on the tape when they were debating, when do we put the parachutes out? Slack. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Are we supposed to do it now? Splash. <laughs> Oh boy. And then, you know, uh, mission control is on the radio playing taps and taunting them and they're, they're all having a great time with it. That's good. That was the That's highlight good. of the semester. Awesome. I'm going to take that thing on the road again. Once, once uh, I get it perfected. <laughs> Caitlin, Please, I've uh, kind of capitalized this, uh, this beginning here. And, uh, but um, uh, how did you get to meet Tim? I think you guys touched on that a little bit. You met while you were still going to college. Uh -huh. uh, any special circumstance that happened? Were you listening to a lecture of his or? I, so Blackwater Falls was a combination of, um, that was mainly with the Kanawha Valley Astronomical Society and oh. a little bit of the Central Appalachian Astronomy Club. And they were going to Blackwater uh, Falls in <coughs> West Virginia, very pretty dark skies there. It would only be like a quick little weekend uh, event, but I can't remember if I was giving a talk at the time or I was just there as a participant because I had given a talk at Blackwater a couple of times. Yeah, I, I, the first time I think I really got to speak with you was when you were giving one of the Mars talks. Okay. Uh, okay. But I, I had at least seen you maybe been introduced by Mark Cocte before then. Uh, oh, you know, yeah. No, I've, I've known I've known Mark since I was like nine. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I've, I've known Mark for a long time. I, but yeah, that's right. That's right. So, so Mark probably was the one who introduced us at the time. And, uh, and then we just kind of roped you into Central Appalachian Astronomy Club uh, craziness and start Green Bank Star Quest. Yeah. And we just kind of, I uh, kept chatting from there and talking about Apollo simulations. I think at one point we were talking about uh, Hyperion, which I would love to, to chat with you about Still that again. To start up that project. And you've been helping with the uh, astrobiology project that I've got a research student working on now. One of my biology right. makers is That's looking to right. see whether water bears, little microscopic tardigrades, could survive, not only survive, but thrive, could reproduce uh, in a Martian environment. So we're yeah. working oh, on getting kind of like heavy salt water things that wouldn't evaporate and uh, could keep the oxygen pressure up inside there, stuff like that. Yeah, I would definitely love to chat with your student at some point. That'd be nice. Uh, but yes, so, uh, so that's pretty much how, how uh, Dr. Tim and I uh, have met many years now. Uh, but I'm so pleased that you're able to, to come chat with us about gravitational lensing for seven months of science, especially when I, I emailed you and you were very enthusiastic. I'm like, yes. And, uh, and I <laughs> allowed you to pick any topic. You're like gravitational lensing. So, uh, so go ahead and take it away, Tim. All right, well, thank you very much. And thanks again for the invitation. Uh, really appreciate it. And yeah, I, I had, um, when Caitlin had asked me, I said, well, I know exactly what I'll talk about because right within like that week, uh, my uh, colleagues and I had just gotten a paper published on a gravitational lens, which I had discovered by accident. Uh, we were not looking for it. And so, um, but I'm gonna start off with uh, some background. Now, let me ask though, because we've been chatting and so on. How, how long do you want this to run? Hmm. Four or five hours. Okay, great. Um, so I'm going to start off with the beginning of everything. I'm, I mean, this is going to be a James Mishner novel. We'll start off with like how the, you know, the Eurasian land bridge works out. And right. so on. Uh, okay. This program runs 30 minutes. Sometimes it runs an hour, an hour and a half. So it's, okay. it's up to you. It is not a very time specific there. No, no, um, no. I, I, that, the James Mishner thing, my parents would always joke about James Mishner novels, which they enjoyed and read, but would joke about, you know, he, he's, he starts everything off so far back in history. And there was some book they were reading. And I said, uh, so what is with this one? Does he start like back with the, uh, you know, the formation of the, uh, of, his book on Hawaii. I said, does, so does he start with like the volcanoes popping up? They said, yes. Yes, it does. <laughs> <laughs> I've That's got a good, I've story, a good way to begin. Yeah. I borrowed the Mishnah book Space, which I haven't started reading yet. It's been, I don't know, like 30 years or something. Mm -hmm. But um, I think he starts with the Big Bang on that. <laughs> but it's like a, an alternative history of the Apollo program. Okay, so anyway, the um, so gravitational lenses. Now, let me see. 
Al, I'm going to do this, the application sharing here. Uh, let's see. I will put it onto the slideshow. Okay. And then I'm going to switch over to Zoom. Yes. And I'll do share screen. I've got two monitors going here and sharing, and we'll see what actually winds up happening. Okay. Okay, I'll just share the desktop like that. Now, let's make sure that you can see. Okay. And I, I see saw. your whole desktop. Okay. All right, do you see the-, okay. the... Now we see it in presentation mode. Okay, that great. A gnarly picture of- This is not mode. what I took, by the way. I can't claim credit for this, but it is just about the most fantastic gravitational lens example I could find. Now I'll get into exactly what all of this stuff is uh, a little bit later, but um, let's go on to the beginnings of gravitational lensing, very much like a Mishner novel. Right? Uh, so early on, there had been predictions that light could be bent by uh, something with mass, by the gravitational pull of an object. Uh, it was, it lay inherent, uh, implicit, implicit, I should say, in Newton's uh, theory of gravity. And it was pointed out during Newton's lifetime uh, that this could be, that this could be done. And, um, but uh, it, it worked up that Einstein had, when he published his general theory of relativity in 1915, uh, he had made also a prediction that gravity would bend light rays. And his prediction differed from Newton's prediction by a factor of two. That is that hmm. uh, gravity would bend light twice as much as Newton's theory predicted it would. Well, how would you test something like that? Well, in 1919, there was a total solar eclipse. This is a photograph from it here. Now, total solar eclipse is a fantastic chance to test the bending of light. So the idea is, is that the sun itself would act as the magnifying glass, the lens. Now, actually, let's not think of it right now as a magnifying glass. Let's think of it as you're looking through a crystal ball or maybe one of those round fish tanks, and it's gonna distort the views of things that you see behind it. Um, let's take a look at the, let's make this into a negative image. And you see marked out with the little uh, tick marks there. These are several bright stars. Now, the reason we use a solar eclipse is because you can see the stars during the daytime. Why do you need it during the day? You, because if the sun's gravity is gonna be bending the light of those stars, then they're going to appear in different places than they normally would. Yeah. So we can take a picture of the night sky with the sun not there with this constellation and we can map out those stars in a photograph. Then we wait for a solar eclipse when the sun is right smack dab in the middle of that constellation, take another picture with it there, and with the, sun, with the sun covered up by the moon, it's nice and dark out, you can see the stars. And then we compare the two. And what we find is, this is a drawing uh, from the 1922 eclipse actually, but I can find the schematic, mm -hmm. is that you see here on the right, now I don't know if you can see my cursor, does that come out? Uh, yes. Okay, there's the drawing of where the sun is and out here, the shaded part, that's the corona. All right, so the sun's outer atmosphere. Okay. But what you see is you're seeing each of these dots is the location of a star. And the line extending from it shows you which way. Uh, so the, the dot is the star where it would normally be. And the tip end of the line is where it was during the eclipse. Now, the, the, the length of those is actually exaggerated, but it's showing you the directions and the relative mm -hmm. magnitudes. And what you notice is, is that those stars that are closer to the sun, here and here, everything within this area here, um, are shifted noticeably farther away, while those that are start off being farther away from the sun are not shifted much at all. Now, true, there is a bit of shifting in somewhat random directions when you get out here. And that's because we have imperfections. The glass plate can be uh, stretched a little bit uh, from heat and so on like that. When you're taking these in the middle of the day uh, you, and, and you have to have sunlight focused on the plate, it, it will heat up the plate. And that's why uh, mm. we had to, it took years before they really nailed this down. However, the results were ultimately after a few of these runs, conclusive. Sir Arthur Eddington, shown here on the left, led the expedition to Brazil in 1919. And this is an illustration from a New York Times article here. Here you see the path of the sun's shadow over South America and then over Africa. And they sent two teams on this that he led. 
And um, this is a, a drawing of what his equipment was like. So he has his telescope laid out horizontally and under this tent to keep the sun off of it. Because, you know, well, you amateur astronomers know when you're, if you're trying to do uh, solar eclipse photographs or anything solar, how hot that stuff can get. When I was doing the 2017 eclipse, I put aluminum foil over my uh, cameras to, uh, to keep the heat down. So he had that tent up over there, and then he's got a mirror here to direct the sunlight into it. And this path shows you, it's really neat, how the path of the light of that star, the star is actually here, it uh, gets bent by that amount there, a little bit of a curve. And mm -hmm. so we trace the line backwards, it appears as if the star is over here. And so this is an illustration showing that the stars seem to be shifted away from the sun, straight away from the sun, like that. I love the New York Times headlines for this, uh, for this event here. Uh, lights all askew. Uh, let me stop the, uh, let me hide. You can't see the little hiding, the uh, controls up here at the top, can you? No. Okay, great. Uh, so give us up the headline a little. Lights all askew in the heavens. The, my, the subhead is my favorite. Men of science, more or less agog over results of eclipse observations. <laughs> the more, it's the more or less that, that just puts that in, uh, Hmm. That right? Also, hmm. uh, stars not where they seemed or were calculated to be, but nobody need worry. <laughs> yeah. um, now, so um, <clears throat> that's where things lay in the early 1900s. Mm. Einstein had predicted stronger the possibility of stronger gravitational lensing, not just a little distortion, but like multiple images. But he said there was really no chance that we would ever observe any such thing. It's just that's not the way nature would work or the telescopes would, be, would, would need to be too big. We just couldn't do it. And then came 1979. Now, this is a more recent photograph. Uh, the one from the 70s is really just very noisy, static looking. But what was found was here's a cluster of galaxies. Uh, you can see the uh, kind of orange colored galaxies are the ones in the cluster. And then in the middle here, you see two bright lights. Let's zoom in on that a little. Well, that's not where it was supposed to be. Hang on. Uh, there we go. No. Come on. Huh. You know what? That frame wound up. Um, I did some cropping that went wrong. My preview shows me a zoom in on exactly this spot here, but when I go to it, it's not. So I'm just going to. Can I zoom? I can't zoom. All right. Um, if you can see this, you see two bright blue lights on either side of that orange galaxy. Those are two distant quasars. A quasar hmm. is a kind of active galaxy, one which is uh, whose central black hole is actively sucking in clouds of gas. And as they are about to fall into the black hole, they heat up from friction. They're getting squeezed. They heat up from friction. They glow not just red hot, but ultraviolet hot and X-ray hot. And so we can see these from clear across the universe. So these, these two images of a quasar are really interesting. Well, it turns out when you look at their chemical spectrum, uh, this is the most thrilling spectrum image right here. All right, but it, this is a spectrum showing the chemical, uh, the chemicals in it. And for those of you who know a little of spectroscopy, you see from one of them, uh, let's see, the one on the bottom here might be the one on the right, and the one up top was the one on the left, for example. And you see little spikes at the same wavelength. This is color here. So this is infrared here. This is blue over here. And so like you're in the green to yellow like that, there's the red. So here's a carbon emission line, another carbon line, calcium, magnesium, and so on. And you see those emission lines are in exactly the same places, which tells us these are at the same redshift, which means they're at the same distance. In fact, they've got exactly the same spectrum. They finally figured out this was two images of the same quasar, mm. but its light had been split by the intervening galaxy. So here's how this works. This is an illustration from the Chandra X-ray telescopes website. So um, if you've got uh, one quasar here on the left and you've got a galaxy, which acts as the lens in the middle, and then you or Chandra are over here on the right to look at it. So here we're looking from the side. So the light of the, re of the actual quasar is bent, a light ray that would normally just go off and off and off and we would never see it, gets bent by the force of gravity as it passes over this galaxy and it's been around rather sharply, in fact, and happens to aim at us if we happen to be in the right spot. Meanwhile, there could be another path going down, and that light ray would normally just keep on going down and we'd never see it, but the gravitational pull swings it upward, and it happens to hit our eyes in hmm. the same spot. 
And so what we would see, because our eye assumes that light travels in straight lines, are two separate quasars. And we trace that back there and there. And so the view in the camera would look like this, with a galaxy in the middle, that's the lens, and then two images, A and B. And by convention, we label them with letters. These are called the components of the image. So that's the twin quasar. The first one of these, that's what's called strong gravitational lensing, where you get multiple images. Uh, first one was found, 1979. Now, not too long after that, in 1985, they found this. <coughs> This is a more recent image from the 1990s with the Hubble Space Telescope, but it shows what's called an Einstein cross. Again, it's a quasar. And in the middle, we've got a galaxy, that's the lensing galaxy. And then we have four images of the same quasar, mostly more or less symmetrically arranged around the galaxy. Here's a more recent Hubble image of it in color. And how, now it's a much, what we call a deeper image. Uh, amateur astronomers use the same terminology, so I don't need to explain it. Um, a deeper image of the galaxy. And you can see that the lensing galaxy is really pretty extended, but galaxies are more massive near the center, the more densely concentrated stars there. And so the, uh, it's that center that's doing most of the lensing. Notice how this one component here is brighter than the others. And it's also skewed off a little bit. That's because the alignment between the quasar and the lensing galaxy is not perfect. If it were perfectly lined up, we'd get a different appearance. It'd be symmetrical. Let's take a look at another Einstein cross here. This one's pretty spectacular. Here you can see the lensing galaxy kind of extended and then the four quasar images. But look at this, you get a little bit of arcing around that. Now this makes sense though, because if you have a perfectly spherical or symmetrical galaxy, then there would be no preference for the, it's splitting the light left or right, up or down. What about it? Not, at, 45 degrees or 10 degrees or whatever. And so you could smear it into a complete arc, which I'll get to in a bit. This is well, a very recent, I was very surprised to find this, the Gaia Space Telescope, uh, which is a, uh, it's a spaceborne observatory whose job is to map out as much of the, of, as many of the stars in the Milky Way as it can to get accurate positions. This is updating a project from uh, back in the nineties called Hipparchos. Uh, by the way, Hipparchus is named for the Greek astronomer Hipparchus, who had come up with the uh, magnitude scale back, uh, what, fourth century BC, something like that. Um, but Hipparchos, H-I-P-P-A-R-C-C-O-S, I think, is an acronym. And it's one of those things where in astronomy, everything is an acronym. At NASA, everything is an acronym. And in many cases, I tell you, we start with a cutesy acronym and then we decide what it's gonna stand for. It's honestly like high parallax, something, 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 something. I forget the rest of it. Um, there's a collaboration I'm on called um, CANDLES, C-A-N-D-E-L-S, which again, we kind of came up with the acronym first and then figured out what it would stand for. But with the James Webb Space Telescope, which we've, <clears throat> we've already been awarded time on the James Webb and we haven't even launched yet, we were coming up with a new acronym for the collaboration to the James Webb era. And we finally came up with SEERS, C-E-E-R-S. Um, I forget what it stands for, but honestly, when we were putting in the research proposal to propose for time, you know, the PI on it, the principal investigator who's the head of it uh, says, all right, here's the, here's the proposal. Any comments, we're gonna put it in by Friday. You get one or two comments and that's about it. It's a giant collaboration. And then like halfway through the week, he said, all right, so what should, we, what should we have the acronym be? We had about 27 emails over two days debating what the acronym would stand for. I don't even remember what it stands for in the end. We had like a dozen meanings all for the same acronym. And I don't even remember which one won. Some of them were just completely jokes too. So anyway, sorry, Gaia is also an acronym, but it's, it, you know, guy. Uh, but anyway, its job is to look out for positions of stars to map out the, the three-dimensional shape of the Milky Way. But it also was able to find a number of Einstein cross gravitational lenses. Generally, what you see is that the lens itself, which will be in the middle, let's take a look at this over here on the middle right, uh, that the lens will tend to look kind of, we call it red, like to an astronomer, there are only two colors, blue and red. All right, so I'm gonna call that red. And um, 
because it will be tend to be a giant elliptical galaxy with ha which has older evolved stars um, rather than young star forming galaxies, which will tend to be blue. And the lensed images will tend to be blue, which here of course looks white, which will either be quasars or younger star forming galaxies in the early universe. Uh, so those are all a bunch of Einstein crosses. Here you have some more with the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, here again, we've got a red lens and then the images here, you can barely make out the fourth one, right? Oh, no, sorry. There's the fourth one right there. That little blob there is just a bit of noise. Uh, but there we can see three and then a fourth one off like that because they're not aligned right. Here we see that more symmetrical. Now, something about the symmetry. Notice an elliptical galaxy is an ellipse. It has two axes of symmetry. And you'll see here that that symmetry of the lens is reflected in the symmetry of the lensed image. Hmm. So wherever you have the narrower dimension, all right, so here we've got the narrow dimension is this way, uh, if you can see my cursor. Hmm. And that means that the mass, if you, if you draw, take the, 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 uh, the major axis, the, the long dimension here, okay, draw a line there. You would expect if the quasar in the background is pretty much lined up with the middle of that there, that you would get a mirror image one side and the other of that. And for the most part you do. But now, if you could draw along the long axis, that means that perpendicular to that, the mass is pretty narrowly concentrated al along this middle line here, okay? So the denser it is, and we're, I know it's not like three-dimensionally dense, but if you project all of that mass onto that line, it's denser along this line than it is along this line. You see a perpendicular to this line, it's more stretched out. So the denser it is along the line, the more compact, the wider the lensing, the wider the split between the images. Here you get the longer dimension, so it's more stretched out, less dense that way, and so you have the images closer in. And you can see that here. Uh, here we see a very circular looking galaxy, but the, the uh, object, the quasar in the background is probably offset about to here. And so one of them is split over like that and the others over that way. Actually, it's probably, I'm not sure. I always forget which way it goes. Okay, so here are some more from uh, the late 90s. This is 1999. And um, you can see here, look at that. There's the lensing galaxy and you get this weird little split on either side. Here you have an arc, three images which have merged into an arc and a fourth one over here. Here you have two arcs. Here you've got a cross, another cross, a, two, a twin split, another arc, arc, and arc like that. The arcs are where you have multiple components that have blurred together. Now, what if you have a perfectly symmetrical lens, that's the galaxy that does the, the magnifying, and you have your background image, your background object, completely lined up with it, you get an Einstein ring. <clears throat> the first one of these that was found was back in the 19, oh boy, uh, I had the date written down. I'm gonna say 1979 again. Um, that may be off because they, that was the, also the year they found the twin quasar. But not too long after that, maybe the very early 80s, with radio telescopes, they found this weird thing, or an arc with two blobs there. And it turned out they finally confirmed with spectroscopy that these are at the same redshift and this was the first known Einstein ring. Now, it turns out to be easier to find those sometimes with radio waves because the radio source, the emission region for that is physically big. Like if you've got a radio galaxy, you can have jets that go out millions of light years into space and a bigger source can create a more, um, when, you, when you magnify it, it gets blurred out more. And so you, it's easier for it to form a ring. And I'll show you a demonstration in a minute. So it took a long time before they were able to find a visible light image with an Einstein ring. But in the 1990s, they did. And here is, this is um, late 90s. Actually, it might be early to, no, late 90s, late 90s. And this is the first basically complete Einstein ring seen with visible light. This is an image with the Hubble Space Telescope. We see the lensing galaxy here in the middle, and then we see the ring. Notice though that the ring is not perfectly uniform. We've got a bright arc here, and then we've got a bright blob here. Again, reflecting that same kind of mm -hmm. asymmetry 
Um, it looks kind of like a bow with an arrow. You can think of it that way that we saw in those uh, earlier Hubble release images, uh, press releases from the from 96 that I showed you. All right, but look, when we look at this thing with radio waves, we see that it's not a complete ring. This tells us that the radio emitting, uh, it's generally a plasma jet that emits uh, radio waves with synchrotron radiation, where you have electrons moving at near light speed trapped in a magnetic field and spiraling around it. So this tells us that the radio emitting jet is offset from the center. The visible part of the galaxy is lined up with the lens, but the radio jet is offset. <clears throat> Color images really do a nice job. This is the uh, Sloan Lensing uh, Advanced Camera for Surveys Lens Survey uh, called SLACS, S-L-A-C-S, because again, everything is an acronym. And what they did was they took the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which is uh, run off of the um, uh, Apache Point Observatory in Arizona. And it's a digital camera with the first, maybe the first wide survey of the sky with a digital camera done right from the beginning, started up in the 1990s. And uh, what they did was they looked at chemical spectra of uh, distant galaxies there and where they found two different redshifts for the same object. Well, they figured that, well, look, if there are two different redshifts showing up, then probably it's two galaxies at different redshifts, and these could be gravitationally lensed. So they went back with a Hubble, and they imaged a bunch of these. It's really a very clever approach. And they found a bunch of these. And here you see a lot of nearly complete Einstein rings. Here you see in this one, you see some kind of extended stuff there, which means that the source is also wider. There's another one there. Uh, here again, you've got some extended stuff. Uh, this one is about the most complete ring that I've seen. And then here you've got, again, some more swirls and stuff. That could be a spiral galaxy, the blue in the background there. Again, blue light tends to be from either a quasar, which is very blue and hot, or it is from a star-forming galaxy, like a spiral. Okay, so what can we do with it? I mean, these are pretty pictures, but we can use this for practical reasons. There's one of the Einstein crosses called the cloverleaf. And uh, my graduate uh, uh, advisor, Dave Turncheck at the University of Pittsburgh, uh, got some time on the Hubble, and we did a little study with it here. So here are the four components, the four images on it. Now, if you look with, um, we take a narrow band filter, and this one is set for a uh, high ionization line of nitrogen. So uh, quadruply ionized nitrogen, uh, hot, hot, hot nitrogen. And we see four separate emission regions there. But when we look with hydrogen, sorry, I did say nitrogen, right? Nitrogen, nitrogen for this on the left. But when we look with hydrogen in the ultraviolet, what's called the Lyman alpha emission, we get what's on the right. And we see that three of these are connected by an arc. Now, what I was mentioning earlier is that the larger the emission region is in your source, way back in the background, the more blended together the images will be, the closer you'll get to forming an, an Einstein ring. And in this case, this tells us that the nitrogen is emitted from a small compact region. So we get four point sources with a little bit of connection, but not very much there. But the hydrogen is glowing in a wider region out here. And so we can use this to measure the size. This is, in, this is a quasar that we're looking at. The trouble with quasars is, is that they're so distant, but they're so small. They're the, the very central cores of active, the most powerful active galaxies. And they're so far away, they don't even exist anymore. They only exist far away, which means in the early universe. Hmm. And that puts them so far away, and it's hard to see the core. We can't see the core. But with, a, with an Einstein, with a gravitational lens, we can magnify it enough where we don't see like the whole image, but we can measure the size of different parts of it. This is a full color image I put together from our different exposures there. We never got the paper published. We had it almost completely written, but one of our collaborators who was doing the gravitational um, mass model of the shape of all of, you know, how, what is the lensing galaxy doing? You can't even see the galaxy that does the lensing here. It's too faint, uh, but we see the, uh, the rest of it the distant background. He wound up taking a job in South Korea where he's from and it was hard to get a hold of him and he never got back to us on it. 
And other people since then have published on this. So we got completely scooped on our own discovery. So oh. those to show you, always get to work and publish. <laughs> <clears throat> well, there's more that we can do if we have an entire galaxy cluster it can act as the lens as well. This cluster was one uh, discovered and cataloged by George Abel. It's called Abel Cluster 370, just object number 370 in his list. And uh, the Abel clusters have been intriguing targets for, uh, uh, for astronomers for, for decades because of how they tend to be bright, they're very compact, massive. And what you see in this, it just, I could stare at this thing for an hour. Oh, yeah. Look at this big arc right here, for example. That is, uh, I think this is the one that they've nicknamed now the dragon, because uh, you can see the head and then the tail of it. And it snakes around between different galaxies. I'll magnify that moment. But it's not the only thing. Look how this really is like you're looking at a picture of galaxies through a fishbowl. See how everything on the outer edge is stretched into a thin, thin, thin arc. And you can see the rings that they make around, not complete rings, but partial rings. What these, what these arcs do is they more or less show you, they may make the contour, uh, the contour lines for the mass of the cluster that does the lensing. So you could almost draw out the mass, the shape of where the mass of this cluster is by just connecting the dots on those arcs there. And then you get weird stuff like a straight arc in the right dead center on it and you know, stuff that cuts through here. So it's a little more complicated than that, but to some extent you can do that. Look at this little ragged bit of stuff over here. And some of these you, um, I can't guarantee, but we might be seeing multiple images of some of these spiral galaxies like that one. I don't know, I don't think it's the same one as this one here because the center of it looks a little different. But some of these like over here, we could be seeing several, several repetitions of, of the same ones there. Uh, you don't know really until you look at the redshift of them. And that's actually a problem because to find the redshift means spectroscopy. Spectroscopy takes long exposures because you're spreading out the light over through the entire spectrum. So it takes a long time to expose and you've got to do a separate spectrum for every single one of the targets. So it's very time consuming. But there is a new tool that I'll show you. In a bit. Here's zoomed in on the dragon here. So you can, see, you can see the spiral shape. You can see the arms going around um, uh, it's like a pinwheel that would be rotating counterclockwise this way. And then we see it stretched out. And then we see the tail here, which I think is the same galaxy. They're, I think they were checking to see if it was a different one. And mm -hmm. it wins its way back and forth, wiggling around the other galaxies in the cluster. It's oh, wow. absolutely incredible. Yeah. Um, I, I was not familiar with this one. Oh, it's a well-studied one, but, um, but there's a, an old book my uh, postdoctoral advisor at NASA at Goddard Space Flight Center, Elihu Bolt, who had really kind of set up the high energy laboratory there back right at the beginning of NASA, like 61 or 62, around just after Goddard was, was founded. Um, he was still on, I was his very last postdoc. And um, he gave me some, uh, just as a, uh, maybe a, uh, uh, it was a free astronomy textbook he'd been given late nineties probably. Uh, just maybe when I started teaching for me to teach from as an example, but it was uh, a, a complimentary copy from the author of that book, uh, Kaufman, I think. And the cover of the book, I've been, I haven't been teaching from it, it's a little out of date, but I've been using it to prop up my computer on. And I looked at the cover and it's just this black and white photo with some stars or something. And then this arc blob. I was looking at it a few months ago and thought, what is that? Looked at the caption inside and it turns out it's this. It was the first picture of it when they had no idea what they were looking at. They just saw an arc and they thought maybe it's a galaxy that's just gotten stretched out by tidal forces, which happen a lot. Or maybe it's the collision of things. Maybe it's a nebula arced out. And it wasn't, they, they finally got the chemical spectrum to place the redshift. And they, it took them years before they finally nailed down this was a lens created by the entire cluster. And that was the first one that they knew of. And I'm pretty sure that it was this one here. I thought I'd taken a picture of that of the book cover so you could see that how much better it is when you get a fantastic uh, telescope like the Hubble to look at it in color, but I can't find the picture. And it's, my office is an hour away. So trust me, this looks a lot better. Uh, so anyway, 
let's go on there. So what happens when you have a cluster magnifying? Well, for one thing, you don't get very symmetrical, simple images, do you? You get very complicated ones. They're twisted. They're, they're distorted in irregular kinds of ways. And that means that if you want to see, to see what it is, uh, like if you want to use it as a magnifying glass, more properly, really a telescope, because it is for something distant, you need to model the gravitational well, as we call it, the shape, the mass shape of everything in the cluster. But that can be done if you're work hard enough at it. Here's a picture, the first time I ever saw this done. This is, uh, I believe it's another Abel cluster, in fact. This is a 1997 press release from the Hubble Space Telescope. Again, nice color picture. And they took a picture of this cluster, and you can see here, here you see a little blue arc, another blue arc. You can see these on the outer parts here stretch just a little, and then there's this red thing. If we look only at this galaxy, we go up to the upper right, that's it, okay? Now notice, this has clumps in it. Now the little, the little tiny flakes of flecks of red there, that's really just noise, okay? We're getting way down to very faint stuff. However, mm -hmm. when you model the gravitational well of all those galaxies in the cluster, you can undistort that lensed image and come up with what it actually looks like. Now, of course, we've got, we've, it's very pixelated. And so we, we've got a very weird look to it. It's hard to make out what that is. It's still very clumpy, but you can make out those clumps are for, from star formation in the very early universe. Mm. This is at a redshift. Uh, for those who are watching, if you know your, your redshifts, it's, it's at a redshift of 4.9. Now that's what we call Z. Um, at very low redshift, redshift is approximately what fraction the speed of light is it moving away from you? But when you get up above a redshift of like 0.3, you know, 30% the speed of light, beyond farther away than that, then it's, uh, it's the formula breaks down. Really, it is a, it tells you how much the light is shifted and we can use it to find the distance through Hubble's law. So we, when I say redshift, you can just think of it as distance. Uh, and it tells us how far back in time we're looking. Because if you look at something that's one light year away, light took one year to get to you. So you see it the way it used to look a year ago. So if we look at um, the Andromeda galaxy, all right, we can see that with the naked eye, that is 2,300,000 light years away. So when you look at the Andromeda galaxy, you're seeing it the way it used to look 2,300,000 years ago. That means you're literally looking backwards in time. And I mean literally, literally, not figuratively, literally. This is literally backwards in time. And it's incredible. I mean, if you were standing in Andromeda looking at the Earth with a giant, giant telescope, you would see the Earth as it used to look 2,300,000 years ago. Hmm. So we can use this to look back into the early universe. This, the light from that galaxy has taken 12 billion, 400 million years to get to us. So we're looking backwards in time over 12 billion years. And the universe is slightly less than 14 billion years old, 13.7 or whatever our latest update is. So we're looking back almost to the very beginning of the universe with just that. And that was back 24 years ago at this point. We can do some others. This one is not one that's reconstructed. Uh, so much as it is simply brightened. So a, a gravitational lens does two things. It, well, three, it distorts the image, it magnifies the image, and it brightens the image. And so here is another gravitational lens cluster, uh, Abel cluster 1689. And you see a whole bunch of the, my goodness, those thin arcs there are just in, incredible again. Uh, if you see a red arc, uh, the blue arcs are generally because you're looking earlier on in the universe, which means more star formation farther back in time. Most star formation is over and done with by now. And so you're seeing bluer galaxies uh, because they're forming new stars. But if you see a red one in many cases, maybe not always, that is going to be way far back and is gonna be looking redder maybe because it's red shifted. All right, but here in this case, we see that little blob there and we look at it with the Hubble that is infrared light of another, it's another very distant galaxy and I forgot to compute exactly how 
many billions of light years away, but it is billions of light years away. So again, we're looking back in time. Here's one that's actually a little bit, um, a little bit closer than the previous two, but it's a great example. Uh, this is a cluster, it's a Sloan Digital Sky Survey, so SDSS uh, cluster there with a great name of J1110, plus, that's the coordinates really. The cluster is at a redshift of 0.65. So that's, that's, that's getting to decent redshift for what kind of stuff I do. But this arc here, the blue arc, is at a redshift of 2.5. So that means we're looking backwards in time 11 billion years. Wow. Uh, by the way, redshift and how many light years is not a one to, it's a one to one correlation, but it's not a linear thing. As you keep going up in more, you know, one more billion light years at a time, the redshift goes up, uh, not exponentially, but something like that. So here, when they've done a great job of reconstructing it, so it's kind of an elongated galaxy. And again, look at the clumps, again, star formation. So that was supposed to introduce the stuff that I just talked about, reconstructing distant galaxies, which we have now done. Well, the paper that uh, my colleagues and I have just, uh, just gotten accepted, the uh, preprint is out, if you know where the uh, astronomy archive is, A-R-X-I-V, it's a joke because X for the Greek letter chi, so archive. Uh, uh, anyway, go to arxiv.org. By the way, it used to be at, um, I don't know if Los Alamos still uh, hosts it. It used to be you just went to uh, <clears throat> uh, Los Alamos's website, but they had it as xxx.lanl.gov rather than www. I don't know what that joke was. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, arxiv.org, and you can search through these here. This is one uh, uh, we've got out on there now. So the backstory. Um, boy, almost 10 years ago now, maybe not quite that far, maybe seven years ago, uh, my colleagues and I had gotten some time on the Hubble, and we were looking at quasars at a redshift of 0.7, so you know, a few billion years ago in, in distance. And we're looking at quasars. That's a quasar right there. Quasar is, stands for quasi-stellar radio source. It's almost but not quite an acronym, because with the radio uh, telescopes back in the 1950s and 60s, they were getting some radio galaxies with these fantastic plasma jets. You could see a dumbbell shape stretching out into space on either side. And there are other things that were unresolved points of light, star-like in that sense. So when they finally uh, found these things, they called them quasi-stellar, you know, sort of star-like radio sources. Of course, later on, we found that only about a tenth of them are really strong radio sources. Uh, most of them are what we call radio quiet. So that's where you get the term quasi-stellar object or QSO, but really I think quasar is a good term for all of these, radio loud or radio quiet. So we're looking at the galaxies that, that host these things. What do they look like back farther on in the universe? Are they merging galaxies or what? Well, you see, all we needed for the picture was just that little region right around there. But what you get with the Hubble is this big region all around here. This is the Hubble's wide field camera three using the infrared uh, setting on the camera there. Mm -hmm. And it is a great instrument. It is the, the primary instrument on the Hubble today. And since we have no more space shuttle, that's the last primary instrument we've got. The others are off to the side. But we've got all this space around it here. So what I like to do when we get these things hot off the Hubble is to go and just look at what else is in them. And you just got, you know, you're the first person ever to see, you know, that little galaxy there, for example because no other telescope was looking at this. And, and from the ground, you just can't make it out unless you're doing a giant eight meter telescope with adaptive optics. And so I was looking and I found, oh, there are a lot, of, you know, a lot of galaxies in this upper left region here. And then I found that thing. What in the world is that? Hmm. Now we have one, I don't have color for it. This is an H, an H band image. This is Still kind of near infrared, but we're getting closer to the mid infrared. On H band image, it's 1.6 microns in wavelength. All right, so this is a black and white picture. I've just made it be the kind of orange color for make it look more appealing. Zooming in on it here, what we see are these parallel lines, dashed line, two blobs, another dashed line, and an arc like that. Well, we racked our brains for months, really, in some ways, for over a year. 
uh, we thought it could be a, um, a nebula, you know, those protoplanetary nebulae. Sometimes you've seen Hubble press release pictures with these beautiful but butterfly colors and shapes to them. And the magnetic fields can funnel the outflowing gas from a, from a star uh, uh, from that and from, a, from the white dwarf. And so my magnetic field's doing it, but it doesn't pinch off in the middle like we expect. Well, okay, maybe it's weird. So we did the math. Turned out it, for it to be a planetary nebula, it would have to be way outside the Milky Way, farther than any had been seen before. So no. Uh, then we thought, well, <laughs> my old uh, uh, collaborator, Dave Turncheck said, Tim, you've caught the Hubble's, the, uh, not the Hubble, the uh, International Space Station. Look here, you can see the solar panels here and over here. Uh, I don't know, it does look kind of mechanical there. I did the, I looked at the coordinates and it turned out it was in the wrong place. It would have moved over the hour we were observing uh, if it were the space station. It's orbiting, you know, 90 minutes as well. And so, so it's not that. Geostationary satellite, it would still be moving a little bit north and south, so not that. A friend, there was even one who half jokingly suggested aliens, but so anyway, we finally figure one of our guys, Anton Kokomor, is on this Hubble, um, the, um, the Frontier, Hubble Frontier Fields collaboration, which looks at uh, clust galaxy clusters and a lot of gravitational lensing. And he said, you know, we've got, we started looking at some of those and we found occasionally some weird gravitational lenses with that. Now we had considered a gravitational lens, but you sh I've shown you what lenses look like. They're arcs, they're round, or they're split into multiple images with a, with a, around a round galaxy in the middle. The only way we figured you could get this kind of thing would be if the galaxy were a thin line horizontally here. And even then, why would you get the perpendiculars to it? It just didn't make any sense. Well, so we start working on that there. And um, so we think, all right, so it's, it's a lens, but we've only got this one image. We can't really do anything with it. We write a discovery paper, put it into the Astrophysical Journal. They say, yeah, that's not enough physics for us to publish here. So that gets rejected and it just lies dormant. In the meantime, some other people are looking in uh, at the cluster, which by the way, the cluster was unmapped when I found it. So I also found the cluster there, but it's, you know, that's not a big deal. <laughs> um, but they were looking at this cluster. So now in the archives, once those data are public, we've got other filters. So I can make a color image of it. Now look at it. Now you see how the color stands out as blue. Here. And also this part of it is bluer than even the rest of it. The lensing galaxies in the cluster are more orange again. So I talked to a friend at the University of Hawaii at Hilo, Richard Griffiths, uh, who used to be at um, Carnegie Mellon when I was at, um, at uh, Pitt. And um, so he said, well, you know, that's actually an interesting object. I could get time on the kick for that. And so, uh, so he did. And so we've been working on this paper that we've got published now. And what he found is, if you look at, I'm zooming out and I've mixed up the color balance a little there. But if you zoom out a little, look up here, you see that? He identified on the basis of shape alone that this is a third image of oh, that wow. and that. Are you kidding so, me? Yeah. And he did it with a black and white picture. He had not seen the colorway version that I made at that point. We did it purely on shape, not on color, which is, I, I am really impressed with that. So anyway, so we have like A and B here, and then C is the third image of it. And he says, well, look, that looks like it may be a spiral galaxy there. So what we found is we've got uh, Jenny Wagner, Wagner, I guess, at the University of Heidelberg in Germany. She's doing the general relativity for us. She's our, our GR expert. And so she has worked out that... Um, if you take here, here's our picture of our least distorted one, component C there. And so there are what we call these caustic lines. Now, caustics are, boy, I should demonstrate this for y'all real quick here. I've got a, an, artificial, um, an artificial gravitational lens. Now, let me stop sharing. I'm going to go back to camera. Look, I'm in the dark here. OK. So what I hold here is. We had, a, uh, we had some stemware that broke and I saved the, uh, the foot from it here. I picked this trick up from a guy who uh, uh, did the uh, uh, Castles lensing survey with the Hubble uh, 
Castles also is an acronym, and but it's a joke because it was founded, uh, funded by the Smithsonian, like the Smithsonian Castle Building. And that was a, a big lensing survey done in the 90s. And what he showed me at a conference was, is that the stem of a wine glass or another goblet can act as a lens. It, it works pretty much the same way. So here I've got one that works a little better. Okay. Now, if we take a picture, here's a picture of a bunch of galaxies. Now I'm going to have to avoid the glare here. I'll stand up and do it. Okay, that's without the glare. Now let's take the, let me hold it by the edge. And you oh, see, yeah. if, we, now, if the lens, now the lens here is invisible, but imagine this is a massive elliptical galaxy. If we move it in front of the background, look how the distortion moves across there. That is cool. And if I line it up just right, which is difficult to do looking upside down, there's our Einstein ring. You see that? Uh-huh. And you get a demagnified image inside the Einstein ring's radius if you're just a little offset. And then you get a big distorted magnified one just outside it. And then as you approach the alignment, they merge together and form the ring. That is so cool. That is very cool. I'm going to use that. I'll have yeah, to get this is a great to show you. And if you set it up with like a projector and uh, you take a piece of cardboard and cut holes in it for the sources and then use a projector and then move it across, you can, you can uh, do all the different kinds of uh, uh, lensing that way. And it's a little more impressive than doing it with the, uh, this all here. Uh, so anyway, um, so there's what's called the caustic curve. And the caustic, let me go back to screen sharing. The caustic is the, uh, the line of the points where, uh, let's see here. Okay, I'm sharing that, but now I've got to go to that there. Okay. So if you draw, so imagine that you've got your, all your cluster galaxies around here. Now this, weirdly shaped line. If our source, our distant galaxy is outside that curve, you'll only get a single image of it. If it's inside the curve, you'll get multiple images of it. And by the way, I had to look at the definition of caustic repeatedly. I, um, I'm not a specialist. I don't do the, the D distortions, the undistortions of these things. And the math is a little tricky. My wife, by the way, she is a gravitational expert. Uh, she's kind of the, the GR expert in the region here. She works on gravitational waves. Um, so I kind of have to ask her for some of these, but she doesn't do the lensing either. So anyway, so if we take the, our image here and we straddle the caustic, what you get is not three separate images. If it were inside, we get three separate ones. If it straddles the caustic, we get one here and then two that are tied together. And the critical curve is uh, back when we had a nice symmetrical round lens, the critical curve would be <coughs> the Einstein ring if you have it lined up that way. So when you've got it like this here, we wind up with a weird stretching that way. Now we had to go through, or really Jenny had to go through, several versions of how the caustic shape should be in the mass distribution to get it right. Uh, but after a couple of tries, she found it. And notice also the parity, the alignments here. See here, we've got, uh, you've got that little blob there and there, okay, corresponds to that. Here it's on the left and there it's on the left. If you have different shapes of the mass, you could get it where this one is mirror image left and right. And so you can throw away some of your mass models by looking at the alignment, if it's a mirror image or not. And here we've got the reconstructions of it. Hmm. This is from component A, from B, those two are very distorted, and C, which was not very distorted to begin with. But they, they pretty much come out to be the same when we undistort them. What you can make out, and I think we see it best with the C here, is that we've got a spiral arm probably here. The chemical spectrum looks like that of a star-forming spiral galaxy. And it's at a redshift of... Uh, it's not extremely distant. It's at a redshift of 0.82, but that puts it where the light has traveled 6.7 billion years to get here. So uh, it's still, you know, halfway back to the beginning of the universe at that point. Um, 
So we see a spiral arm and maybe a little bit of star formation in the other arm. We would expect it to be there, but it's not really showing up. Maybe there's dust, maybe it's fainter, less star formation. Uh, so we can, we can see what the star formation is like in the early universe then, earlier universe. But another thing we can do with it is we can look for how clumpy it is. So if the, um, if dark matter, uh, so you know about dark matter, this is the mysterious stuff that makes up 90%, well, I forget, it's actually much more than 90%, but it's 90 to 95%, whichever scale we're dealing with, 90 something percent of the mass of the universe. And we don't know what it is. So there's what we call normal baryonic matter, baryons meaning protons and neutrons that make up the most of the mass of an atom. Normal matter is baryonic, but that's like less than 5% of the universe there, um, of the mass of the universe. Most of it is something else. And we have theories. There's the WIMP theory, which is the weakly interacting massive particle. There's the macho theory, which is the massive compact halo. Again, you get where we're going with the jokes here. <laughs> and right now it looks like the WIMPs are beating the machos, by the way. Massive compact halo objects would be like maybe miniature black holes in the outer halo of a galaxy. Mm -hmm. uh, but we haven't seen enough evidence for those. WIMPs would be subatomic particles interacting only with the weak nuclear force and with gravity uh, and not with electromagnetism, not with strong force. And therefore they do not emit or absorb light. That's why they're dark, we can't see them. However, we can't find them either. <laughs> I mean, we've been, there have been teams that have been searching for over a decade with running one experiment down in a salt mine for a decade and they've come up with precisely zero detections when they would have expected under like the standard model of particle physics, a thousand and they get zero. So we still don't know what they are, and it's kind of embarrassing. But there are a lot of different particle theories out there. So maybe at some point we'll hit on one. But we can use gravitational lensing to map out where dark matter is. You see, you take a cluster of galaxies, and you um, uh, subtract out the mass of all of, let's see, you, you, you look at the, the, the lensing around it to model the mass of the galaxy. Then you subtract the visible mass, the visible matter, the lights of the galaxies, and so on like that. And uh, what you come up with then, what's left is the dark matter. It's invisible, but you can see where its gravitational pull is. And we've got, we see big giant clumps of dark matter in, cl in galaxy clusters. Great. Well, we can use this gravitational lens to measure it on smaller scales too. And uh, right now uh, in our paper, we have found that we can get it down to um, uh, scales that we see that dark matter is smooth on a scale of, a, I think we put it to six kiloparsecs. I would pull up my paper, but then I'd have to stop screen sharing. So um, so six, um, what would that come to times three? So about 20,000 light year scale, it's smooth on that scale. We can't probe smaller yet unless we're able to get a better model of the mass of the cluster. Then we'd be able to probe on smaller scales how the dark matter is clumped. So we're working, we're gonna get, uh, hopefully we're gonna get some uh, uh, X-ray telescope observations and the hot gas throughout the galaxy cluster is like a million degrees Kelvin, so like 2 million Fahrenheit, um, stirred up by all the active galaxies and things like this and supernovas throughout the cluster of all the galaxies there, that hot gas, uh, can be seen with X-ray telescopes, it glows in X-rays, and we can use that to pinpoint the exact center of the galaxy cluster. If we can do that, we'll be able to start looking on smaller scales for the dark matter. Well, there's something else here that's kind of neat, is that uh, here's from a um, another, again, I was sure that I had written the notes on this. Well, anyway, it's, a, it's another cluster. Uh, it's one of, I think it's one of the Abel clusters. And you can see here that this team has worked out where the caustic line is as well. So it's got this weird loopy caustic line. And you see that this galaxy, it looks to me like something, one of the aliens from the game, video game Space Invaders, very much like that. And um, so it's, it is transformed in the same way that mine is. Well, the <clears throat> it turns out that in their case, you see that little blue thing there, that transient, that is probably from a massive star that just crossed over the caustic line and went up to, at the caustic line, you get a very, very high magnification and things will be very, very bright. That is, I believe, a single star in this galaxy. 
Now, as the galaxy rotates, as stars in the galaxy are moving, they will occasionally cross the caustic line and they'll be magnified and brightened. And if we can monitor this, take pictures of it every few months or weeks or whatever the time scale should be, we might be able to watch that happening in a galaxy that's 11 billion, what did I say, 11 billion light years away? Maybe 6 billion light years away. Um, Crazy. It, yeah, it's amazing to magnify it that much. Well, so anyway, now I want to put in a monitoring campaign to watch that, but that's kind of time consuming and we'd have to make a good justification to get Hubble time for that. But fingers crossed, maybe. Now, another thing on this here. So you see this blue, faint blue arc. This is going back to mine. And by the way, I, <clears throat> I uh, had mentioned to Richard, I thought, well, look, I've, I've discovered this, this weird object. We don't even know what it is. We didn't know for sure it was a lens at that point. And uh, I'd said, you know, there's, there are these weird galaxies out there that sometimes get the name of the discoverer like Hoag's object, and there's Hewitt's lens and so on like that. And boy, it'd be fun if I got this thing named after me, but I don't know. I don't know if that'll ever get picked up by anybody. And I, I'm certainly not going to write up something. I'm, I'm not going to call it after myself, but you know, I wouldn't mind if someone else did. Well, Richard goes and publishes this paper calling it Hamilton's object. And so... <laughs> which I take as a great compliment. And now if, it, if anybody else picks up on that, I'm really going to owe him for a very long time. But at the same time, I can't go and you, I can't call it that myself. So I'm just gonna be calling it, so I'm still calling it the mystery object in the folder on my, on my computer here. But So the mystery object here, which now we know is a lens. Um, so there's this little blue arc. And I thought, well, that looks like it's something else that's very strongly lensed on it. If we zoom in on it here, expand it, we get that. It's very noisy, you see here, but we can see that there. Well, what Richard got, let me go back to stopping the screen sharing. And uh, actually, maybe I can do this without that. Is, okay, you're all seeing that there. Let me pull up mystery object. This is no longer embargoed secret stuff here. Okay, so he got uh, data with the Keck, which has a, uh, what's called a the Keck Cosmic Web Imager. And that is what's called an integral field spectrograph or just integral field unit. It's a really neat instrument. What it is, is a, um, there we go. Uh, it is a camera where every pixel of the camera um, gives you the chemical spectrum at that point. Wow. So you do chemical spectroscopy at the same time you're doing imaging. And these are just fantastic devices. Uh, but now let's see here. I need to shift. I can go, I can scan this in wavelength from all, near ultraviolet out to the green to orange there. So let me go here, let me scan through a bit. All right, that's kind of high contrast. Now this, the, the, we set it where it was mostly adapted for spectroscopy, so the picture looks like that. It doesn't look like much. But let's scan through here. Now, keep in mind, oh, there we go. So there's, there's the mystery object, there's the lens. Okay, and we can read off right here, this is the wavelength in angstroms, 10 to the minus 10th meters. 4,979 angstroms is um, blue, a little close to blue, blue green there. Now, if we go in a bit farther, you can still see at longer wavelengths, let's play through this here. At longer wavelengths, we see that thing comes and goes. This is mostly noise. Here we see a bit more emission. Here we're getting spectral lines. Here we see some galaxies that show up here. As we get on a little bit more, that thing shows up with an emission line at 5,000 angstroms. That thing shows up again there. I need to go a little bit faster because what you're going to see is here, that. Hmm. Now, this here, it is 
this is a great thing with this uh, software called DS9, uh, which is literally named Deep Space Nine after the Star Trek show. The early version of it was called uh, uh, SAO, Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory Imager, uh, TNG, the next generation, which was also named for Star Trek. <laughs> All right, but here we see the chemical spectrum here. We just read it off in wavelength. And so up is brighter. Over here is the blue end. Over here is the red end, uh, really kind of yellow. And look at this giant emission line spike right there. That turns out to be very likely the Lyman alpha emission. It's the ultraviolet emission from hydrogen, hot hydrogen gas. And it's, we get this one big line and almost nothing else, a little bit of squiggly stuff there. Well, that, Richard explained to me, is called a Lyman alpha blob, uh, which uh, he and I both noticed in this thing here. And it shows up, if we look at it, in, our, uh, uh, in that green filter, it's so redshift that ultraviolet light becomes green. Okay, so it becomes literally much redder in, in color. And, um, so here we make it out. I've, I've gotten out of the seven filters that we've got here, I think it's seven, five filters that we've got on this. I can see it just barely in three of them. So we've got a little bit of a spectrum beyond what the Keck showed. And um, this is at a redshift of 3.6, I think. Let me go, I've got the redshift written down here. 3.2, which puts it 11 billion, 600 million light years away. And that means we're seeing, we don't even know what Lyman alpha blobs are. We've got ideas on them. We just see this glow of Lyman alpha in the sky, but we don't generally see a galaxy with it, uh, maybe because it's too faint, too far away. But this glow of hydrogen is very easy to see. So there are theories it could be from a quasar. It could be a glowing gas around a quasar, or maybe it's from a galaxy cluster. Maybe it's from a heavy star formation. And so there are a lot of competing theories. Well, I think we might be able, if we can improve our mass model of the cluster, to nail down how much this thing is magnified. And if we can do that, we can see how big it is. And if we know how big it is, maybe we can start to pin down what a Lyman alpha blob really is. And, um, so I've got an undergraduate student uh, who's over at Marshall University, Peter Burberry, is uh, I've got him looking for other versions of this little streak here by looking for, I mean, it's so stretched out, we wouldn't be able to match it by shape, uh, but maybe we can match it by color. So I've got him looking on the color image and he's gonna see if he can find anything else of this color in the entire cluster there. And uh, that'll be candidates for us to follow up to see, to see if we can see other images. So we, can see we can see multiple images that really, really, really help the, uh, the, uh, the model. The model uh, with, uh, with, and then we can use the better model to go and magnify stuff better. One thing that I'll leave you with at the end of it, this is not going to the distant early universe, but this is just the craziest idea that I've seen, which I think will work. A guy at uh, Glenn Research Center uh, in Ohio has come up with an idea to use the sun, our sun, as a gravitational lens. Now, of course, Eddington uh, already did that back in 1919, over 100 years ago. But what he saw was what we call weak lensing, practically micro lensing. This would be using strong lensing, meaning multiple images, even uh, an Einstein ring around our sun. But what you've got to do is you've got to stand way, 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 way back in order to get the magnification uh, that strong. His idea is you get a solar sail here to push a spacecraft with a telescope way out about 500 astronomical units away. Remember an astronomical unit is the sun earth distance, 93 million miles. So let's round it up to hundred million miles times 500. Mm. Um, what does that get us to? Uh, 50 billion miles? My rapid mental arithmetic is not that great. Anyway, you get out far enough, but still not outrageously far. And if this is the sun here, and we've got light coming in from a very, very distant object um, coming around our sun, the light would be focused for places anywhere from here on farther out. Okay, so we're taking a side view here. These are the light rays, which would be Focus, and if you put the telescope here, the light rays from something coming from here and here would be focused on you. 
And what you would see would be an Einstein ring of that distant object, which would have very large magnification. But you know what he wants to look at with it? Planets, exoplanets, planets around other stars, which right now we can see, a, we've got about 4,000 planets known around other stars. Most of them are completely invisible to us because they're very small, they're very small, and they're very close to their host star. And so they shine only by reflected light for the most part. And so they're just swamped by the glare from their, their parent star. In a few cases uh, where the planet is very large, very far away from its star, like a big Jupiter uh, or even a brown dwarf, we can, with a big telescope, we can just barely make it out. But that's like a handful of cases with direct pictures of them. His idea is let's take a look at the thing for real by using the sun as our telescope. Okay. And then okay. we can get slices of that planet as it cut through the Einstein ring there. That is a fantastic, crazy idea, but I think it would work. Uh -huh. That's ingenious. Hmm. And again, like he says, you'd need to have a computer to deconvolve it to reconstruct the planet. You get these kind of slice pictures of it there. Very I'll end up with that on it there. Wow. I mean, it just, wow. <laughs> <laughs> It's it's one thing to just look at like really pretty pictures and and go like oh hey look at that and try to have um, like demorphization uh, techniques and yeah. you know the future of AI um, I'm sure will be uh, very prominent with the with the demorphization techniques mm -hmm. as well um, I'm curious then I uh, would we be seeing more hopefully more of these objects from James Webb. Uh, so lenses, uh, uh, um, bigger, more distant gravitational lenses. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, there have. When I was looking up some good press release images to include, I found stuff. So, like I said, uh, this collaboration of mine is going to be getting time on the James Webb uh, early on. What's called the early release science, and uh, so we just keep waiting for it to be launched. It's supposed to go up October thirty first, Halloween of this year. We just heard there's going to be another launch delay because of a trouble with the fairing. That's the, the kind of the shell on the Ariane 5 that it's going up on. It's, it's slipped to at least November. I forget if maybe it's now December. Um, I was looking at uh, one of these old press releases and it was saying, and this gravitational lens data with Hubble is going to pave the way for the James Webb, which is due to be launched in 2013. <laughs> And that was after several delays already. It was supposed to go up like, I think 2007 was the original, original date. Wow. Yeah. yeah, like Green Bay, that, yeah. At um, Blackwater Falls, I gave a talk on uh, the James Webb and what am I getting for my 10 billion for real? Uh, and it was, I plotted out all the launch delays over, like by year by year, what year was it supposed to go up? And it's kind of that the seesaw pattern that goes up like that. Oh boy. It was supposed to be cheaper than the Hubble, and now we're up to the last I, I calculated, last I read, it was 9.5 billion. And that doesn't even have the operating cost yet. Right. <laughs> oh dear, we were so yeah, what, what is the storage cost? That's a good question. I don't know. I mean, this is a I mean, big, it's, big. It's held in a giant clean room, right? I mean, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you, you can't put a lot, you've, you've got to have space for it. So, right. I mean, it's not like NASA's renting the space, but that takes up room that other stuff might, they might need to move Very in. True. So, yeah. um, but anyway, no, uh, so James Webb, because James Webb is optimized for the infrared. It will barely be able to see visible light just into the deep red part of the spectrum. Uh, but it'll go from that part of the red way out to a few microns. I forget exactly how far. And you know, it's got this, um, Sorry, they kept shrinking. I remember the old days when it was going to be like an eight meter something telescope. It's not. It's like five and a half meters across, I think now. And it's been it's been settled for about a decade. I should remember this now, but uh, um, but it's it's got a big a big telescope, so high resolution, but long wavelengths. So it's going to see very distant objects very well. The more redshifted they are, uh, it'll be kind of 
you know, like that ultraviolet will be redshifted into the infrared so we can see star forming regions in the early universe with this thing. There's a lot of science that's gonna be done with what's called the era, uh, the first light, the dark ages and so on. You've got the big bang, the universe gets bright because it's literally red hot in the beginning. And then as it cools off, uh, the gas turns transparent. Okay, neutral gas, typically transparent, but then you get your first stars forming after some amount of time. We don't know exactly when. And once those first stars form, the ultraviolet light from them reionizes the hydrogen gas and you get the uh, hydrogen emission again there. So that epoch of reionization, the end of the dark ages, as we call it, is something we're trying to pin down exactly when did that happen in time. Um, but you can get close to this with gravitational lenses. And so with a, a man-made telescope using a natural telescope deep out in space is a fantastic use of the artificial and the natural working in tandem to do incredible amounts of magnification. Mm. Fantastic. I can't it. It's so, oh, fantastic. Yeah, it's, it's, it's so amazing that uh, we can use a natural occurring thing like that and be able to, you know, reconstruct uh, what's going on out there. Um, and it seems to me uh, that perhaps we've just started to learn how to use this uh, mm -hmm. lensing technique. So yeah. there's a, there's a book, just thinking of that thing with using the sun as a lens, um, there's a book that I came across, which, oh, let's see here. I'm trying to find it on Amazon. It, it's like from the 1980s, maybe early 90s, and uh, is out of print. And, um, ah, Unusual Telescopes, that's it. And um, Unusual Telescopes by Peter Manley, M-A-N-L. Okay. And uh, this book, well, 1995, I might, I'm gonna have to buy myself a copy. Uh, I got it out of the Pitt Library one time. And um, he goes through weird things like using um, the atmosphere of Mars was used as a lens. Hmm. And it wound up magnifying and making a, uh, it's, it's not from gravitational lensing, which was one thing they considered, but it was from the, Fresnel uh, from uh, the interference pattern of light bending through the atmosphere, and then you get you get kind of these this diffraction pattern uh, around it there, and we happen to be lined up, and they were able to do some uh, stellar studies or something like that with it. They found this when they were looking. Oh, they found it when they were looking at the at the Martian atmosphere. Here's Mars, and you've got this star, and it occults the star. Okay, as it okay. the star blinks out, it dims first by the atmosphere before it blinks out completely from the planet. But then when it got dead center, they got a little bright blip again. And then it came back out and it gradually brightened. What was in the middle? It, the bright blip. And it was probably from the focusing effect of the atmosphere. Oh, that's cool. And he's got things like using people using like, oh, I think, um, uh, what's his name who discovered Pluto? Tom Ball. I think he had built a telescope with a, out of a lawnmower at one point, just to uh, push lawnmower to show it can be done. You know, sure. stuff like this here. Right. Unusual setups of mirror and lenses, um, things where the entire building moves rather than the uh, rather than the scope or other oh, stuff. Oh yeah, like Russell Porter's uh, turret telescope. And, yeah, I think that yeah, that one's in right. there. Um, right. All kinds of neat, weird stuff, but the natural things were in there too which first got me thinking about this. That's interesting. Peter Manley. All right, we'll have to check Manley. it out. There's, yeah. a couple of, there's a question and a statement here. Um, Harold Locke's question is, is um, the big question in my mind is, can we follow these early formations to the point where they are today? So you mean like trace, uh, well, I will speculate here, to trace forward in time. So we see something in the early universe. Yes. And then what does it look like today? Well, we only get one image of it. So we only see it in this snapshot early on. 
we can look at, instead we can look at different galaxies at different stages of evolution. If we can choose galaxies that we believe are all in the same family, that are all kind of related to each other by mass, by shape and so on like that, we can uh, trace out not a single one, but a class of galaxies. Hmm. That's actually the weird thing about astronomy is that it's um, like, we can't wait for 10 billion years to watch one galaxy grow and evolve. So right. <laughs> snapshots in time of 10 galaxies or a hundred hmm. galaxies, or if you're really big, like big archives in the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, maybe you can get thousands of them. And you trace them out over time that way. Uh, and, and you can kind of do it just once something you see in the distant past, that's the only time you see it is where it, the way it used to look, the way it, where it, it used was. to look. Yeah. You get that one shot at that one galaxy. Oh, but it'll always look like that. So that's, that's useful. Now, Martin Eastburn uh, made a statement. Some of this is breaking, <coughs> breaking out of secret research from the ABM projects of the 60s to the 80s that was doing special lines with radar returns. Now, I haven't heard about that. Um, spectral lines of the radar returns, so that would be, I, I reckon, with radio spectroscopy. And unfortunately, I don't do radio work myself, so I'm kind of ignorant on that. I will say, though, that something that I, I do, um, uh, well, I don't really do myself, but uh, gamma ray bursts. So these are the most powerful known explosions in the universe. Uh, they are from colliding black holes or colliding neutron stars or a neutron star in a black hole and so on. Or, or actually, uh, sorry, colliding neutron stars or a super hypermassive uh, star that goes, instead of a supernova, goes into a hypernova and collapses directly to a black hole. And these produce bursts of gamma rays. And um, these were first seen with the Vela uh, gamma ray uh, spy satellites that we put up to check on the Soviet nuclear tests. Hmm. So a nuclear test will give off a gamma ray signature. And so we could check to make sure they were really obeying their, their side of the treaty by orbiting these Vela satellites around. So in the 60s, these things were put up. And by the, I think maybe by the mid 60s up to the early 70s, we were seeing flashes of gamma rays, but they weren't coming from down on the earth. They were coming from up in the sky. I mean, what in the world is this? Nobody had ever seen anything like it before because gamma rays don't make it to the ground. You've got to be in space. And the space age was just beginning. By the way, so this is true with x-rays, with gamma rays, a lot of the ultraviolet stuff, and uh, good parts of the infrared. You have to be in space above the opaque atmosphere in that wavelength regime. So they, um, the scientists were able, who were working with Vela were able to use this. There's some debate as to whether any of the research was classified at any point. And I, they say it wasn't. There's a misconception that it was really classified stuff. But um, uh, they weren't certainly weren't putting out all the capabilities of the satellite then. Um, but that discovery was made with national security assets. Hmm. Uh, so kind of like with this uh, anti-ballistic missile uh, research from the 60s to the 80s there. That's neat. Interesting. Okay. <clears throat> well, that's great. Um, I don't see any other questions, uh, but I think you sufficiently blew them all away. Um, and I think you gave many of them uh, greater insight into uh, gravitational lensing and, and uh, you know, how it all works. So the, the thing I find most fascinating is, is being able to deconvolve really distorted images and discover, oh, we're looking at this galaxy over here. You know, I mean, that's just... Yeah. That's just amazing to me. That, and that really takes some computer work. Uh, that could not be done in any efficient way without, you know, some sophisticated computer programs. So yeah. uh, several decades ago, even if we had seen this stuff, we wouldn't have been able to reconstruct it. But mm -hmm. now that's possible. And I'm not going to say easy because it's a bit over my head. There is, by the way, a great book here. I'm looking at this is not really written for the layman. But for any of you who are um, amateur astronomers, if you've got a physics background, you could you could follow through this. It's got some nice pictures, mm -hmm. but it's also got how to work out the uh, general relativity tensors in order to. In okay. order to it's a little bit light reading. <laughs> yeah, this is this is what I'm trying to do to understand what it is Ginny has done for the paper that I'm a co-author on. Mm, great, uh, but it, it it defines those terms very nicely. And I will also say that this book I used here for the lensing demonstration with uh, the wine glass stem, 
uh, Cambridge Photographic Atlas of Galaxies is a great color uh, photo book here. And it's literally an atlas of these things, <clears throat> better than the old ones that were black and white. But in the back, it has a section on galaxy, let's see here, galaxy groups and clusters. Oh, yeah. And then it has um, one on ga and gravitational lenses farther back than that, which I don't have the page bookmark. So there are plenty of good books that you can find that will show you these things and explain you what's going on. And also say, you know, this stuff I'm doing, most of it's Hubble. Uh, there was one picture for this paper that my team took ourselves. Uh, with the Hubble, I mean, we did, the, we did the Keck stuff ourselves. But the others were taken by other teams. Mm -hmm. After one year, all that Hubble data is public. If you go to uh, the Space Telescope Science Institute, stsci.edu, so stsci, Space Telescope Science, SC Institute, .edu, like an educational institution, uh, you can find, look for the archives. Now, it's, it's meant for scientists rather than just for laymen looking through, but you can download the very same data that anybody else would use. If it's more than one year old, it's freely available. And um, you know, if you're an amateur astronomer, if you're used to working with the FITS files, that's F-I-T-S, yeah. Flexible mm -hmm. Image Transport System, uh, that's the standard file format all of these will be in. You do need specialized software to read it. DS9, which I was showing you there, is what most of us use. But there are others like FITS, Liberator, and some others. And these work on all computer platforms. If you've got that, you can download these. We've, they've made it so it's almost like shopping at Amazon now. You put in the right ascension declination or the name of what you want, look through, browse through them, and you put it into your shopping basket, and you download it. And you, you got it. You can play with it all you want. Great. Go be uh, amateur, uh, amateurs with professional data. I mean, I've got an undergraduate uh, who's, who's looking through this stuff. So uh, people yeah, who are experienced. Why not? Work, yeah. Many amateurs are familiar with the FITS file header and, oh, and uh, what FITS files are all about. Um, some amateurs actually do use data uh, from these uh, professional surveys and uh, um, you know, I think it's great where we have amateurs uh, uh, learning how to use uh, professionally gathered data like this. Um, yeah. I think it kind of preps them to do pro-am projects, which do occasionally come up. Um, uh, you know, the AAS is right now involved in uh, uh, really trying to get um, amateurs focused on um, uh, pro-am projects that they'll be uh, supporting and uh, uh, promoting, I think maybe uh, later next year, so. I'd like to see more of that. Uh, if you can send me something on it, you or, or Caitlin, um, because I had been interested, I gave a talk at Blackwater Falls a couple of years ago on what it is that amateurs could do. And I was, I was feeling a little pessimistic because it used to be the great advantage of an amateur was that there are, it's crowdsourcing. There are a bunch of amateurs out there. Right. So like looking for Star, for, for exoplanets with that transit method when it crosses the, the uh, in front of the star. You, uh, you can do that with a Nikon and a telephoto lens. You do not need a telescope. And that means it's cheap. And that means thousands of people around the world can do it. And you can look in a lot more places than one big NASA observatory like the Kepler, for example, could. Sure. However, as you get to broader all-sky surveys like the... the um, Let's see here, the LSST, I forget what it's been renamed now. Caitlin, do you remember? Oh, goodness, no. Nope. I, I, know, I know the acronym, but yeah. not the actual name. It's a high resolution all sky survey. It'll survey the entire night sky like every three days Jeez. on that kind of cadence. But that means that how we're going to kind of take away that opportunity for amateurs to discover comets, asteroids, because you're going to have a big telescope surveying big swaths of the sky. But, but will we? I mean, you know, uh, you know, they make a big sky survey like that. Tons. I mean, we're talking about a huge flood of data coming in. So you no. got big data coming in here. And if they can, you know, if they can get access to uh, fresh data that's coming in, you know, they can say, oh, maybe that's a candidate uh, for a comet or a supernova or whatever. Then they can do follow up, uh, follow on, uh, 
you know, observation. So, so even these big survey telescopes, they're specialized for certain kinds of imaging. They may not do spectroscopy, for example. Right. Uh, they may do, they may be very stable, but maybe they're not high resolution, you know, other stuff like that where amateurs, especially those with kind of bigger equipment can fill that, could still fill that niche. And the amateurs have more time, in principle, available to devote to maybe one thing where the professionals can't because it's you know limited resources there. Right. Yeah. Um, they can but also, get that telescope out any clear night. So yeah, exactly. And and monitoring again, you know, monitoring is starting to become professionalized, but monitoring can still be done on a faster cadence by amateurs than it's going to be for the foreseeable future with professionals there. Right. That's right. I think there's so lots of room on that, on that around gravitational lens. Yep. Yeah. No, uh, you know, by all means, citizen science needs to be better. So. Yeah, and by the way, you know that uh, with the Hubble, in the first cycle, the first year of observations, they actually had, maybe the first two years, they actually had a category of amateur research proposals. Yes. And there were guys who did that. And... Uh, that right. I thought was a great idea. I, I, I'm sorry that they didn't keep that up, but I liked that they reserved a little bit of time for amateurs on that. Uh, one of my friends at Space Telescope uh, did the, uh, the, the collaboration sign with them there. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, if you're interested, Tim, I'll get you, um, I'll, I'll put you in touch with the uh, person that uh, is leading that advisory group, which I'm on uh, for the AAS, so. Yeah. Okay, great. Fantastic. Well, thanks a lot, Ben. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, Tim, thank you so much again for joining us for Seven Months of Science, uh, part oh. two uh, for our June speaker. And then uh, stay tuned then for our July all the way through November. So we got all sorts of speakers uh, coming at you. So be sure to tune in. Uh, and also Scott has a lot more guests coming up um, on various other shows through the week That's as true. well. That's true. Uh, so, this one is so really, definitely. this is awesome though, um, you know, because your, uh, your speakers are really, I mean, uh, fascinating. Um, uh, one of the uh, people watching the program is wondering how I get so many interesting people on, you know, uh, <laughs> this is the, the seven months of science is all Caitlin. She, she is uh, put, putting together the show, um, uh, and uh, you know, again, I, I just kind of hook up the two wires and broadcast this thing. So, um, but it is, uh, uh, you know, it is uh, wonderful that we have uh, these people to, that will take their time to share it with our audience. Uh, so, thank you, Tim and Caitlin, for doing that. That's great. Oh, yes, thank you, thank you so much, Tim. Okay. Oh. All right. Uh, so um, we have coming up uh, beyond this program. Uh, tomorrow we will have um, uh, it, it, it is the Open Go to Community Live, uh, and uh, and then on Friday we have uh, uh, Microcosmos Voyages, which is our our microscopy show which I am, Tim, I'm trying to learn how to use a microscope and uh, it's been a lot of fun. So you talked about tardigrades and stuff. Um, that is a favorite here on, on uh, uh oh, <laughs> he's, got his, <laughs> he's got his microscope, he's ready. So anyhow, um, until that time, uh, we will see you later and, and thanks again, everyone. Thanks. Yes, thank you and good night. Good night. Bye. Hello everybody, this is Scott Roberts from Explore Scientific. And today I wanna to talk about the world famous Galileo Telescope Kit. This is a kit that you assemble by yourself. You'll learn how optics work by assembling the objective lens uh, and also the eyepiece. And there's two different eyepieces that are in this. It's a 25 power, 20 millimeter eyepiece, but it also comes with this very clever little device here that works both as a Barlow lens that will double the magnification of this eyepiece, making it 50 power, or it can be used also as a Galilean eyepiece, which gives 17 power to the telescope. This is what Galileo virtually saw through his own telescope, 
So you can have that same experience that Gal Galileo had looking at the moon, uh, looking at Saturn's rings, looking at Jupiter. Uh, it is a telescope that was designed for the International Year of Astronomy in 2009, and uh, it's a fantastic kit, both for child and adult, uh, to learn how a telescope works. And so if you c get the telescope like this, you can either have it on a stand like this, you can hand hold it like a pirate's glass, or on the bottom here, we have a uh, threaded hole here that you could put it on a camera tripod. Very versatile, very rugged, and a lot of fun, all from Explore Scientific.